All right, so how are you all doing this evening? Thanks for coming out. I am Richard Green. I am an attorney. I'm an environmental litigator. So all the things that Stacey just talked about, that's my world. Yes. Uh, I do a lot of permitting challenges. Uh, the issues about Swift Mud, the Water Management District, or FDEP at the state level, that's where I spend my day. And so it's very difficult to follow Swift Mud or follow the DEP and then say, hey guys, something's wrong with the pond or whatnot. Where you can actually make a difference is before that permit is issued. So you will get notifications if you ask for them. You can go online to Swift Mud, you can go online to DEP, and you can be notified of anything that happens in your area. But if you submit a comment before the permit is issued, that's where they take a new look at things. Understand something. I'm going to get to my presentation from. Understand something. These people are there to do a job. They are not the top level experts in their field across the world. They are hired to work for the government to do a job. And their job is this much of this project. They check the box, it goes to somebody else. There's a problem, you have to speak up before it gets through the machine. Okay, now, yeah. so let me go to my thing. I'm going to say that. So I have been asked to talk to you about land use, not environmental litigation, which is okay. I do some of the land use too. But my name is Richard Green, attorney. Um, I already said that, so I'm going to say it again. But this title. From cow pasture to condo is Carol's idea, and I'm stealing it because it's awesome. Uh, but she's basically asked me, look, how does a, a piece of ag land turn into a commercial development, turn into a Home Depot, turn into a condominium? How do we go from that point to that point? And so I'm going to give you a very high level. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of specifically Manatee County Planning Commission. I'm going to give you a very high level so that you have, you have an understanding of the statutory framework, have an understanding of what the counties are doing, so that if you do want to object to something, or you do want to talk to your county commissioner, or you do want to show up at a meeting, you have an idea of what's important to the discussion, and you don't just come in and say things like, I don't like the idea of more houses, even though I just moved in last year. So we need to have better firepower if you want to stop something, for example, Right out the back of my neighborhood, they wanted to put a massive new Home Depot, and there's nothing there but residential homes. And so we needed the right firepower to go and stop that project from happening, and we just found out today that that project is not happening. So I'm really happy about it. Okay, land use is boring. It's all about the process, and the process is laid out in statute. You cannot deviate from it. It is what it is, okay? So it's governed by a combination of state, you all don't care about that, uh, regional, and you don't really care about that, and local, you care about that. That's the stuff that really matters to you, okay? We're gonna talk about the comprehensive plan, close by quickly. The comp plan, think of the United States Constitution. It is a general framework for how everything else flows, okay? Then we have zoning laws, which is a bad word, but or ordinances is a better term. Those are like the statutes that implement the Constitution. All right? And if you've done anything in the world on TikTok or Facebook at all, and you have these, you know, armchair lawyers and whatnot, you talk about things, you at least know all the statutes have to follow what? The Constitution. Zoning ordinances have to follow what? The comprehensive plan. From there, you get your plats and your subdivisions and your site plans and your building and construction permits. Okay, all that stuff comes later. We're going to focus on the top two. Okay, so comprehensive land use plan. All right, I put a statute up there, but comp plan comes from chapter 163. How many of you all are familiar with the wetland uh, issue here in, in Manatee County where they changed the comp plan to remove the buck? How many of y'all are familiar with that? Okay. That's, that's, that's this, that's the comp plan, okay? And the state legislature had an idea that if you don't like the comp, or if a developer doesn't like the comp plan, they need to sue the county. 
to make the county spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then the county capitulates, changes the comp plan, and the developer goes and builds the thing. And the state was like, you know, those, those laws, those, those situations are bad. It's costing the taxpayer a ton of money. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to change Chapter 163, and we're going to add an attorney's fee provision to it. And it's going to scare everybody away. Well, what happened almost immediately is Manti County changed their comp plan, moved the wetland buffer someone sued. And then they found out, in a matter of four months, the county spent $250,000 on people like me. And that individual had to drop their lawsuit on that comp plan challenge. So, if you have an issue, or you hear comp plan, or you're thinking about comp plan, or whatever, Google Chapter 163. It's, a, it's not that long of a statute comparatively. And give it a look. But I wanted to read a quote from uh, 163.3177. And it says that comprehensive plans, this is, this is the goal of a comprehensive plan, to provide the principles, guidelines, standards, and strategies for the orderly and balanced future economic, social, physical, environmental, and fiscal development of the area that reflects community commitments to implement the plan and its elements. Community. Okay, that's the point of the comp plan. So, how do we go from a comp plan to zone? How do we, how do those things, you know, marry one another? So, the comp plan, um, every jurisdiction has to have one, obviously, and every jurisdiction has to have a zoning map. That's important. Just like you can find everything else that Stacy Jesse told you about, the zoning map is at your fingertips. Okay. And it identifies the specific areas that, you know, commercial, industrial, residential density, all of those things. Changes to those maps, those zoning maps, must be consistent with the comp plan. Great. I'm not going to read the Manta County comp plan. It's probably hundreds of pages. That's fair. But they have this future land use map. You can Google this. You can go on the Manta County's website, and you can pull up the future land use map. The future land use map is the comp plan's zoning map. So, if you have a zoning designation for your across the street vacant piece of land, and you're wondering what's it zoned for, and what could it be zoned for, that's on this document. And it is an interactive document. You can click on it, and it will tell you all you need to know. So, if the zoning for the particular area is, let's say, ag, cow pasture, okay, and it maybe has the potential to be res 1, then any other request to change that zoning to something other than one of those two things is inconsistent with that. And they can't just change the zoning. They have to change that. That is not as simple. I want you to notice You notice that, well, it's probably hard to see from way in there, but it's kind of a reddish line somewhat in the middle, a little bit to the right. It, it's a straight line going up, jogs a little to the left, and it, you see that line? How everything to the right of it is light green? You know what that light green color means? Okay. Yell it out. Okay. It means ag. Not commercial, not industrial, not residential. It means ag. And if you zoom in on that, which I haven't done, I just want to give you a general idea. But if you're thinking to yourself, well, what are they doing out there out east? How do they get anything done? How do they build anything out there? Well, all of it has to be consistent with the character of that community. Meaning, they don't build a condo on it. At least not yet. But if I were to roll this back 20 years, you see that little yellow spot that sticks out towards the south there, that wouldn't have been there. Uh, that, that's fair. Uh, that's the first day. So, what have we seen and what is possible? I want you to understand something. This document, your Boulder County Commission, your communities, they change over time. To believe that this is stagnant is silly. It's not the case. There's always going to be a push to turn that green and 
to yellow and from yellow to red to develop. Okay? But as of right now, sitting here right here today, zoning has to be in line with the future land use map. Okay, so let's pretend that you have a cow pasture, okay, and you're wondering how in the world does it turn into well, that would still be ag, but uh, to, to a kind of many. The first thing you need to understand is we often talk about developers, or, you know, and we think of developers as like medallion homes and whatnot. Probably shouldn't think of it that way. Those are actually rather great. You should think of yourself as an investor who comes by and says, hmm, that looks like a good place for a condominium. And they will pay more money than that, that property is worth to purchase it because they think they can do something with it later. But they purchase it as agricultural land. They do not purchase it as something else. Now, some people are smarter than that all the time. They're a little bit more cautious. And they will enter into a contract to buy the land, but the closing date's about 18 months away, and they will go and see if they can change that zoning to what they want it to be before they actually buy it. But in my, in my experience, about eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, an investor goes in, buys the land, and then proverbially puts it in their back pocket and just waits. But they buy it, buy it as an ag land. So if it's ag, if they don't want it to be ag, what do they do? And they have to file, when they're ready, they have to file a request to rezone the property. They have an application, again, this is high level, okay? They have to have an application, they put all these things together, and they submit it to the county staff. They do not go directly to a hearing because the county has to look and see, first of all, can we even do this? Is this even something that can be approved? And again, checking boxes. They're not holding an in-depth hearing. They're not calling you. They're not emailing you. They're just looking at the documentation and seeing, does it work? Okay? And then the county staff is going to come up with a proposal. Now, in the county here, we have a planning commission. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But basically, the planning commission is to the next level after the staff review to see, they're supposed to, see if the request is consistent with the comp plan. And if they say it's consistent with the comp plan, most of the time, Bruce may check me on this, but I would say you got greater than a 90% chance the county commission is going to roll with that decision, even if it's blatantly wrong. But if the planning commission says it, that is their singular role, is to make that determination. So, now, you have that determination. They're like, look, we can actually do this. Possibly, maybe you have to make some changes, but it's possible. Then is when you drive by the big yellow signs on the side of the road, the public hearing notices. You have to have a public hearing. That's your planning commission. That's your BOCC. Okay? They have to hold these public hearings. They have to notify you. Sort of. They have to put a sign out front that you may hopefully drive by and see it, and that's your notification. Okay? And then the Board of County Commission ultimately, at the end of the day, makes a decision. Okay, so consideration. You see all that? Awesome. Considerations for rezoning. What's the staff looking at? What do they care about? Why are you changing it? Well, we want to go from a nice cow pasture and we want to build a, you know, a, home, a home Depot. Why do you want to build a Home Depot? Well, there's a lot of people out there now. They have home. Why the change? They have to describe what they're doing. And here's the fun part the impact of the end development on the surrounding area, the increase in traffic, the effect on utilities, that type of thing. Are you going to put, are you going to triple, quadruple, quintuple the amount of traffic going onto a two-lane road? We can't actually bear that. Oh, well we'll, well, we'll help you build a new road. Oh, okay, great. No, but that's, what, that's the negotiation on that piece. Do we have enough of the, of the water pipes? Are they large enough? That type of thing. Um, for whatever your rezoning issue is. Um, and then you have, interestingly enough, in the chapter 163, a request to rezone requires a legitimate public purpose. Thank you, lawyers, for intentionally being vague. That helps the rezone process along. If you can come up with any reason whatsoever that people might like it, there's your legitimate public purpose. Okay. And then neighbors. Concern of the neighbors. I think that's why they asked me to talk to you all. Because you are a major consideration for rezone. If you don't say anything, I guess it's a good idea, is the idea. So who holds the power? <laughs> I 
I may be speaking out of pocket here, but I feel like you all knew, given what happened in the primary. But technically speaking, they do. The Board of County Commission does, okay? They're the ones with the last say. But I'm going to give you a little secret. This is backed up by statute and backed up by law. There is no requirement to resume. There is no obligation to change the comp plan. The BOCC, they are, they are, they consider the application against the considerations that I talked about previously. But you have no right to use the property in a way that hasn't already been established. That's what I'm basically trying to get across. So, is there a right to rezone? Can the BOC deny your request? Yes, they can. Do it all the time in other jurisdictions. But it does happen. <laughs> Who did I get? Who did I get over here? Does that trigger a lawsuit? Maybe. On what grounds? Mark J. Harris is what they asked me about, but I hear that term thrown around a lot. And I will tell you, my firm, there are people in it that are experts on it. I called them. I said, look, I need a presentation on Mark J. Harris. Like, I know a little bit about it, but everyone's really concerned about it. I keep hearing people just throw it around a lot. They sent me a a presentation they talked to me about it and I was surprised to find out just how crystal clear the law is on Bert J. Harris. So let's talk about it. Now remember, investor buys ag land, goes to rezone it, they deny it. He sues under Bert J. Harris. All right? Chapter 170, it's one of the it's even shorter than 163. It's very, very short. Very easy, actually easy to read. This is a good job by the legislature. And it applies to Italicized and underlined existing uses of property. Existing uses of property. There's a case. It's not even that old. That's like a baby case in my world. It's six years old. And they laid out, hey, what does existing use mean? It's right there in the statute. Let's talk about it. Now, the first part, B1, is whatever the property is being used for now. Okay, so the cow pasture is being used for cow pasture. So I want to rezone and put a Home Depot on it. That's not a cow pasture, so you can't go there. The second one is where I had questions for people, and I know what I would do if I was a lawyer and I wanted to challenge it, is I would go right to number two. Such reasonably foreseeable, non-speculative, that seems like a contradiction. Reasonably foreseeable, but non-speculative. Uh, land uses which are suitable for the subject real property. But here's where they told me to pay attention. This is where the lawyers and the judges get hung up and compatible with adjacent land uses, and which have created an existing, existing fair market value. So, in my situation that I was paying attention to, and I invite everybody to, that we stopped from happening. We had uh, an area that used to be a farm. It was a Lakewood Ranch, short of Manatee. They redeveloped the whole idea, and they changed it from ag, straight ag, to uh, various, types of mixed use and whatnot, but you had specific residential areas, specific commercial areas, it was very planned meticulously. And they left some ag spaces in the area. Well, one of the pieces of land that was being looked at was a piece of ag land, and surrounding it was all residential, one. So he had like, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was R4. So he had a bunch of houses, really little small area, okay? Nothing but homes. And then right in the middle of it, on a two-lane Lorraine Road, they wanted to stick Home Depot. Could they sue under Bert J. Harris if that was denied, which they already gave up, but if they had gone through the whole process and were denied, could they sue? The answer is no, because there's no compatible use next to it. And you can't use residential homes to give you a fair market value for a commercial piece of property. That's the confusion. People, they threaten Bert J. Harris, and maybe county commissions fall for it, because again, they don't like to spend your money in litigation, but understand, Bert J. Harris is not about what we could do with the property. Not at all. It's all about what the existing use is. And the whole point of Bert J. Harris is this last line. To provide potential relief when government does something. Not when you do something. When government does something. So, um, we had some great to be clear. Is there anyone from Anna Maria Island? Drove all the way out here? No. So on Anna Maria, 
uh, about 20, 20, 10 years ago. Anna Marie decided we're done with, we're not doing Airbnb. We don't want short term day rentals. We, we got rid of it. So they changed it to where you could not do that anymore. You had to have a very specific, like they, they, they really minimized what you could do in terms of short term rental. Well, a bunch of people already had homes out there. And here came the Bridget Harris claims. And Anna Maria ponied up all the money in the world to pay all of those claims because they changed the way things were done. So in our situation, our hypothetical, the investor, the hypothetical where the investor bought the land? Well, no, the government didn't do anything. So no, Bridget Harris does not apply. Takeaways. There we go. So takeaways. Neighboring property owners and public are essential to this process. If you hear something and you want to say something, do so. The Board of County Commission is an elected body. They work for you. They should listen to you. Don't make me bring Carol up here. She'll give you her election. Opposition to a project must be present at a public hearing. If you're not there, they will move on from you. Now, I say this, and I know there's a quasi-judicial thing going on. If you can't actually talk to them, send them an email, send them a message, let them know there's opposition to what's going on. But also be willing to talk to the owner. One of the, way, one of the reasons why we got, home, got to Home Depot before they went forward was because we were talking to them. And they personally sent us a message saying, hey, we're going to pull the project, we're not going to go forward with it. So I thought that was really nice. So be willing to talk to the owner. I, you can't ask me questions. This, this changed. So, but thank you. It was fun. Thanks for coming out.